Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for this uh, HPS Pharmacies webcast lecture. My name is Catherine Bennett. I'm the Head of Marketing and Communications for EBUS Group's institutional healthcare businesses, which include HPS and HPS Pharmacies. This afternoon, this educational presentation can be used to contribute to your CPD hours to meet the standards set for professional registration purposes. We are recording this lecture for on-demand playback. Notes will also be available by emailing us following the event. A prompt to do this will be sent to you in 24 hours. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Sarah McHale. Now Sarah has um, kindly stepped in to cover for James today, whose wife went into labor with a child um, today. So we're very excited for James and we're very pleased Sarah could step in. Sarah is the pharmacy manager at HPS Pharmacies in Randwick. So today Sarah will be discussing the serious adverse event associated with one of the newer classes of diabetes medications. Our agenda allows for a quick poll and a five minute Q&A at the end. So if you navigate to the bottom of your screen in the Zoom interface, you'll be able to see a little bubble with a Q&A. That's where you can type your questions into the Zoom interface at any time during the presentation. When we get to Q&A, Sarah will open up for questions. So we hope that you enjoy this presentation and find it very useful to your practice. Thank you again very much for joining us. And I will now hand over to Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry, I'm not gonna turn on my video just to uh, save some um, internet uh, bandwidth. Um, so, uh, the topic today is euglycemic ketoacidosis with preoperative SGLT2 inhibitor use. <clears throat> Um, so, sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, or also known as flozins, um, are used in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Uh, they lower blood glucose by uh, pretty much increasing uh, the uh, excretion of glucose by stopping its reuptake um, in the renal tubules. So, because of how it works, it causes a modest effect in weight loss, which can last, it stabilizes after about six months. It also, because there is a, an increase in urinary output, um, it can act a little bit like a diuretic um, and drop blood pressure. Um, and it has some risk with hypoglycemia. <clears throat> So there is pretty much uh, three different drugs, uh, the pacliflozin, impacliflozin, and erythrocliflozin. And as you can see here, there is a lot of different combinations and brands, and they're all fairly new. So it's quite confusing in hospital because um, at times we chart something and we're not sure that there is a flozin in there. Um, so this slide just goes through the regular doses because it does act on um, that increase in urinary output. It's really important that we um, are aware that these doses are really for um, our patients need to have good renal function. So the pacliflozin is 10 milligrams a day. Impacliflozin is initially is 10 milligrams, but can go up to 25 milligrams, depends on the patient's response. Uh, and atrocliflozin, uh, five milligrams a day initially, and also can go up to 15 milligrams once a day. And these are generally sometimes in combination with um, metformin, um, your um, insulins. Um, it can be with a variety of things because it is generally um, classified as a line two or line three for diabetes. <clears throat> so what is diabetic uh, ketoacidosis? It's a rare site adverse event that is associated with uh, with sorry, um, SG, 
with SGLT2 inhibitors, um, but it also, what can contribute to it includes active infection, injury or surgeries. <clears throat> so like I said, it's an acute uh, metabolic complication of diabetes. It's fairly rare, but um, when it does occur, its major features are hypoglycemia, hyperketonemia and metabolic acidosis. And it occurs when there isn't enough insulin um, that for basic metabolic requirements. So essentially when there isn't enough insulin to signal uh, for glucose storage, um, your body starts to use triglycerides as its main um, source of energy instead of glucose <coughs> because there isn't that reuptake back into the cells, the glucose reuptake back into the cells. Um, with that, there becomes a, a large amount of free fatty acids um, in the blood, and that signals for an increase in glucagon production. The glucagon production um, does two things. One, it increases the breakdown of glycogen into glucose, increasing the um, available glucose in the blood, but also um, because of the, the breakdown of the free fatty acids, um, there is the byproduct of ketones. So ketones are acidic. Um, so that's how it lowers the blood pH. Um, but with that, all this increase in glucose, we also get um, a large, your body's trying to get rid of all that glucose through urine. And with the large volume of fluids being lost, you also lose a lot of electrolytes. Um, so that presents as um, an increase in urinary frequency, polyuria, polydipsia, nausea, and vomiting. <clears throat> and the treatment is usually to correct the dehydration for the patient, correct hyperkalemia, insulin therapy, where there is a high glucose level, but also um, in rare occasions, correcting that pH using sodium bicarbonate. So um, this is pretty much what the characteristics in terms of um, our pathology of what we can see if a patient is in um, diabetic ketoacidosis. But what I wanted to highlight here is diabetic keto ketoacidosis is really not, it doesn't always present with a high um, glucose level, blood glucose level. So at times it's only moderate increase. And in cases where the patient is on um, um, glyphlosins, um, it, can, it can be sitting at between normal or only mildly increased. So um, we need to not exclude it if the blood glucose level um, is sitting within normal range. So what's, I guess, what's the recommendation um, for this is to monitor for signs of um, your glycemic diabetic keto ketoacidosis in, in, in this particular group of patients. And um, generally it will be presenting as drowsiness, abdominal pain, um, nausea and vomiting, fatigue, unexplained deterioration and acidosis. So, if a patient is coming out of surgery, a lot of these things are fairly normal, um, but except maybe the, so if it's two, three days post surgery and really we should be seeing an improvement, but the patient continues to deteriorate, then that's a red flag for us. So how do we, I guess, prevent it from, from happening? Um, generally, we like to withhold um, glyphlosins at least three days prior to surgery. Um, and we have to be mindful that, that when that is occurring, that we might need other glucose lowering therapies. So a lot more monitoring uh, and maybe a sliding scale of insulin. If there is a surgery and it's non-urgent and the glyphin hasn't been withheld, 
uh, possibly consider postponing the surgery, um, especially if blood ketones are greater than 0.6 millimole per liter or the HbA1c is greater than 9% because these are indicators that there is an insulin insufficiency. So if there isn't enough insulin, then we're risking, um, it, it puts the patient at a greater risk. Um, monitoring blood ketones in preoperative pre -operative period. Uh, monitor patients who are unwell, fasting, have limited oral intake. So this is even um, post-surgery or if patients has developed an infection. Um, so we don't recommend to restart up until a patient has normal diet uh, is resumed. And also for, um, so a lot of um, endocrinologists and surgeons prefer that that's not recommenced up until, um, up until close to discharge because we're running the risk of obviously an infection which can deteriorate the patient um, and we're running the risk of them having to go back into surgery. Um, so in, we try to hold out up until discharge to make sure that the patient's well enough to recommence and there isn't gonna be um, future complications. So um, I guess in summary, Patients taking um, SGLT2 inhibitors are at risk of uh, euglycemic DKA. And the, re the reason for that is, um, it incre in sorry, increases the excretion of glucose. So we don't see that um, increase in blood glucose level that is typical with diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, during surgeries or periods of infection of, um, or high stress for the patient, there is that increase in risk for diabetic, diabetic ketoacidosis. And um, it makes it, the, the drug, the medication makes it more difficult to identify because there isn't that um, excessively high um, glucose level. So monitor the patient closely for signs and symptoms. Um, and as much as we can delay recommencing uh, the medication up until uh, close to discharge time. So that's all from my end. Uh, we'll just quickly run through the poll, Catherine. Okay, all of you should probably see a uh, check your understanding poll on your screen. Once you've responded, we'll be able to share the results. Looks like a lot of you have answered question one. Question two, we're getting close. There's only four questions there. Give you a few more seconds and then we'll close it. And then Sarah can discuss the results and then you can open up any questions if you're unsure of anything when we close polling. Okay, 
10 more seconds. Okay, I'm closing polling now and share the results. Sarah, back to you to discuss. Okay, so, <clears throat> so first question was, sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors are also known as, um, and I think we got, um, most people have identified that as flozins. Um, so there, if, if you look at the name, it's impacliflozin, dapicliflozin, and egocliflozin, so it's flozin. So gliptins are also a diabetic medication, um, and I guess sometimes they are in combination. <clears throat> Possible triggers for development, developing <clears throat> euglycemic diabetes ketoacidosis. Um, so we all got that one right. So it's dehydration, active infection, and surgery. <clears throat> Cisagliptin inhibitors should be withheld one day prior to surgery or other similar physiological stress procedure, true or false? Um, so we generally recommend that they're withheld um, at least three days prior to surgery. So that's um, if the surgery is fairly um, urgent, we'll say two days prior to surgery and the day of surgery to be withheld. So that one was false. And the last one was patients may recommend, recommend citagliptin T2 inhibitors therapy in post-operative period once they can tolerate a full oral diet. True or false? Yep, that's true. But just a reminder that um, most of the surgeons and endocrinologists do prefer that we wait up until discharge. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. So now we open to questions. At the bottom of your screen, you can see a Q&A bubble. If you've got any questions, please feel free to type them in or you can raise your hand and I can um, open up your uh, audio so that you can ask your question verbally, if you prefer. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> So if anyone would like to ask some questions, hopefully you've found, navigated your way to the Q&A section. And please go ahead and ask a question. Must have answered everyone's question, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, again, feel free to raise your hand and I can allow you to talk. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Sally, for your question. Sarah, over to you. Um, so yes, it can pre present normally. Um, so generally um, for patients that don't have very good renal function or sitting, right, sitting on the border, um, Within community, we usually tell them if they do develop an infection um, to actually stop the medication to prevent um, a, a like the risk of a diabetic ketoacidosis. So it can, apologies, I don't think I, I actually, I don't know if everyone can see the question, but the question is, can DKA present normally or just as euglycemic DKA? Um, so, um, like I said, yes, it can present normally and it can also present in the 
in the community. If a patient is taking a large amount of medications uh, that are excreted by urine, and they also develop an infection, or their renal function is just sitting at the border, uh, where they, when they do develop an infection, the renal function drops. Is there any other questions or maybe comments even for the discussion? That's a good point, Sarah. Yes, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to um, have a comment, make a comment, share something. If not, um, please feel free to reach out to uh, your HPS pharmacist in your local area um, if you do have any specific questions or you can email us directly. The email will be in a um, thank you notice that will come out after this event. So I feel like, oh, here we go. We've got a question. Over to you, Sarah. Uh, hi, Dina. So Dina's question is, do all the Flozins have a similar risk of um, your glycemic DKA. So it's fairly um, rare side effect. So um, I would, I, to be honest, I, I don't, haven't actually looked at the side of uh, like um, how often they, re, they occur. But in general, I would say it's fairly similar because like I said, their um, mode of action is exactly the same. While we don't completely understand how they do cause the diabetic ketoacidosis, um, they um, tend to put those patients at a slight higher risk. It's just essentially what we're trying to avoid is for it to progress to the point where um, the patient deteriorates or there is, because you're obviously um, excreting a large um, volume and uh, electrolytes, um, it can lead to um, hyperkalemia, and that sometimes is severe enough um, that it can cause death. Um, but in terms of they, they all have the similar risk, I'd say so just because of how minute that risk is. Thank you, Dana. All right, lovely. So on that note, I will thank everyone for your questions. And a big thank you, of course, to Sarah for taking the time to step in and present that interesting material. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I'm sure those on the call also did. Otherwise, we might have cancelled. <laughs> um, so after, so thank you. After you log out today, you'll be prompted to provide your feedback through a very quick survey. It's only like a couple of questions, but it really helps us to um, to make sure that these are delivering the, on the topics that you wish to hear about, um, and also uh, timing, etc. So any feedback's always welcome. We'll be releasing the schedule for next year's webcast. We've run three now. Um, but we find that a lot of people are help finding these useful because they can play them back online even if they did attend. So thank you so much. We will be in touch again for our next event and have a lovely evening. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye.